Let's pray together. Our Lord in heaven, we thank you for the, the blessings of the world, and we thank you for the blessings of the heart, how many friendships we have in this community, and how much love we share here. Our Father in heaven, we most especially thank you for the, the friendship of the Spirit we have with you through Jesus Christ, how much love you've, you've shown us in forgiving our sins, in becoming a, a servant and dying for us so that we might live for you. Our Father in heaven, fill our hearts with joy, fill our hearts with gratitude, fill our hearts with love as we rise to sing your praises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let's rise together and worship God. I, I am uh, really delighted with the, the questions that uh, I've spent the last uh, day or so reviewing. I read through all of your, your questions and my, my mind is really uh, filled with, with your questions. I, it was very easy for me uh, to, to uh, agree with you on, on what you're seeking. And I, I just want to tell you how uh, delighted I am at, at your, your heart and your inquiry. Um, your questions are, are, are wonderful. And of course, the, the purpose of law school and the purpose of, of this class is not uh, to answer all of your, your questions. It's to begin your, your questioning. To question is, is to seek. And uh, when you finish law school, you're not finished. Your, your pursuit begins. Uh, the purpose of, of law school is to prepare you to ask the questions that you're asking and to develop them and answer them in more and more deep ways uh, all, of your, all of your life. Uh, so thank you for your hard work on your, on your questions. Uh, they're, they're delightful. Well, I'm going to jump right, uh, right into them. Uh, this is a good, a good question. It has some good summary of what we've been doing, and then it asks some penetrating questions about them. Uh, this student writes, Recently during Christianity and Law class, we have discussed about freedom and liberty. Uh, regarding the scope of freedom, uh, Dean Enlow, that's me, have, have mentioned that excessive freedom should be limited since it can have conflict with another's freedom. And furthermore, what I understood about the Dean's lecture was that it was important to have a Christian value within the legal system. However, as a non-Christian, I always think about whether a combination of a value and a legal system is, a better, way, is better for society overall. Let us say, should, should our legal systems have Christian values or indeed any values in them, or should they be based on some more neutral principle? For example, a conception of freedom that uh, consists in a slightly more positive way of giving everyone as much freedom as they can have without interfering with anyone else's. This is, this is a, a very solid statement of, of one, one way of, of viewing uh, Immanuel Kant's teaching about the nature of, of freedom. And an example is given here. Uh, it says that in some Asian countries, such as Korea and Singapore, there are, are statutes which require a higher penalty, a higher criminal penalty for murder. If you murder your father, your mother, your, your grandparents, there's a lower uh, penalty if you murder a stranger or someone who's not above you in a familial line and a higher penalty if you murder your father, your mother, et cetera, someone above you, your grandparents. Uh, regarding this act, there are many theories and many disputes going on. One of the main legal theories is that the legal system is incorporated with a Korean cultural value of filial duty, that respect that a son owes to, to parents, which requires people to have more duty uh, to their parents than others. Um, I feel that this law is pursuing certain values by the legal system, though, in a way that harms the dignity of people in the system. And the core concept of dignity, based on my opinion, is to treat man as an end, not as a mean. Again, this is a, a phrase drawn from Immanuel Kant. It's very well, well presented here. However, if certain value is incorporated with the legal system, nonetheless, uh, how is that value good for society as a whole? What I feel is that the system is treating a person as a mere means or method to accomplish its greater purpose of inculcating these values. 
Uh, although I might present my position more logically, I believe that there are possibilities that the above practice would harm the freedom of the people, and therefore I would ask Dean Enloe what should be done to be harmonious when Christian values or other values and the legal system incorporates them. This is a very excellent uh, question, and if I could just say a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, when I was talking about the modern world's conception of freedom, I presented it as essentially a negative, that we, we remove a restraint, and the, the, the pushback that's going on here is to say, well, couldn't we have a, a, a secular conception of freedom like uh, Kant's, Immanuel Kant, a, a Prussian uh, philosopher of the 19th century, where the goal of freedom is a kind of harmony between all people, uh, which uh, finds the locus of value in the dignity of the person and trying to give every person as much respect, as much autonomy as we can without invading another person's uh, zone of, of freedom. And this is, a, this is an excellent question, an excellent uh, pushback, because indeed in, in the modern world, there have been efforts uh, like Kant's to say uh, our ideal of, of freedom is not empty, but it's a way of, of respecting the boundless value of the individual. The, the individual person has to be treated as if they are a great value. And you can sum this up as we do really since the 1950s. Uh, it, as you know, at the end of, of, of World War II, there's a great meeting of people together uh, to try to promote the, the Declaration of, of Universal Human Rights uh, through the, the auspices of the UN. Christians were involved in this, uh, people from the West, from the East, non-Christians, people of, of many different faiths. And the, the compromise words, since nobody could agree on, on where human dignity comes from or, or where human value comes from, is they said, let's make it about dignity itself. We'll just all agree on the word uh, dignity even though we disagree about what it means, we ag agree that individuals uh, are the, 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 the center of value and uh, nothing is more valuable than them and they should never be treated in any way except as ends for themselves. So this is a very good, a very good question. Um, well, first off, uh, Kant and this tradition is very, very deeply influenced by Christianity. Uh, Kant, uh, grew up in a, a, what was then called a pietistic Christian home. Uh, this idea of every man being an end in themselves was uh, first, uh, he drew the, the, the term, a kingdom of ends, uh, from the, the Christian uh, thinker Swedenborg. Uh, he's, he, uh, he basically, when he talked about morality and ethics, although he did so in somewhat secular terms, he uh, expressed more or less directly following what he'd learned from his Christian dogmatic uh, ethics. And, and this, this sense has a great deal of, of agreement. Uh, the, the problem that, that I see, and the reason why this project is, is to my mind an obvious failure today, is that those who screech most loudly, and I'm not talking about you guys, I'm talking about the, the giants of the, the UN and the world bureaucracies, the, the, those people who speak uh, most strongly about uh, human rights have, have no solution for, for the, the basic problem, which is that government requires us to subordinate freedom all the time and to use people as means to all sorts of ends. When we force them to go to war, when we bomb civilian populations to win wars, when we uh, create uh, economies that require some to sacrifice for the, the good of others. The whole essence of politics is now and always has been about the, the ranking of individual goods in relationship to a common good. And there has been no key turned by talk of hin human rights or making individuals the highest value, which enables us to solve any of these problems. Uh, we, we still punish people and we say that when we do so, even in the most liberal societies, we use their punishment to deter others. We use people to deter others from committing future crimes. We lock them up to protect other people. We use them. We use their bodies. And there is not one iota of sense, meaning, or coherence, only ideology, in these phrases which are, are turned around. 
the, the problem of Kantian ethics as a, a, an imitation of Christian ethics minus God or of the talk of human dignity minus God is, if there's no God, if there's no agreement on how we should worship and, and serve him, uh, why should I recognize your dignity? You're, you're just a big, slow boiling bag of, of blood and guts like me. Uh, you're, you're, you have no transcendence, you have no value. You're, you're just a part of the universe like any other bit of, of matter. Uh, Every society makes choices about which bag of guts is going to give way to another bag of guts. And for all of our talk about individualism and whatnot, uh, we haven't solved this problem. So my basic answer to this excellent uh, question is consider whether uh, this Kantian approach, this modern approach that talks about human dignity has really solved any problem. In point of fact, we still make fairly arbitrary choices. We say some things are dignified and some things are not. For example, you should be a free in keeping with your human dignity to uh, murder your child in an abortion, to leave your wife in divorce, to commit adultery. These things are consistent with human dignity, but uh, owning property freely and using it in a business, uh, that's subject to regulation. W why? Why does, why does my human dignity entitle me to uh, have uh, certain kinds of sexual relations, but not freely to enter into contracts with people. There's no good answer. I'm not criticizing them. Everybody has to make disputable choices like this, but the modern choices are ridiculous. They can't be grounded in some neutral sensibility. Uh, we in the, in the modern world value sexual freedom and we don't value economic freedom. Okay, but where is this core idea of, of human dignity? And, and my thesis, and I think what the Bible tells us is, if you don't relate to the word of God, if you, if you don't relate to what he's taught us and the purposes that he's given us, you will find no guidance. If you, if you don't learn to see the, the world and your life as it is in relationship to God who, who loves you and has provided you with guidance as to how we should associate together, uh, you will find yourself unguided. And the, the greatest Kantian scholars, the greatest uh, philosophers of, of human rights, uh, I say empirically have failed to provide a, a meaningful account. And so increasingly, they do it through the brutal power of, of the state, which is the real warrant of their position, uh, not any, any kind of uh, philosophical neutral foundation. Uh, so excellent, excellent question. And uh, I hope you appreciate my reply as much as I appreciate that very, very well-formed uh, and thoughtful question. Next question. In the Christianity and Law class covering constitutional law, uh, we talked about the mystical body in family, state, and church, real entities prepared and created by God. And those three entities all consist of parts, and each part has a specific characteristic and role. Nonetheless, such different parts operate in one. And since those parts make one whole body, acts of one part can affect all. Also, the family and the state are profoundly analogous, and the nature of the family is so deeply connected with that uh, of the state. Uh, Dean Enloe emphasized the relationships between the parts and the body uh, that they make in those three entities, and it reveals uh, our relationship to God and God's relationship between his people. And that is actually the purpose of each of the entity's establishment. The family, in particular, is made by oneness between two people who leave the, his or her father or mother. And then the Holy Spirit makes this unity between wife and, and husband. Uh, Paul pointed out in Ephesians chapter 5 that there is a great mystery in this, that one flesh joined by a man and wife is actually uh, concerning Christ and the church. And so that like Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife, and he should love his uh, wife as Christ loved the church and died for his people on the cross. So this is what I want to talk about. The family is one body, one more. Uh, we heard Dean Enloe's concerns on modern era customs in the class. He was concerned about the reality in the U.S., which people consider uh, individuals as too precious and easily decide to dissolve the, the family. Uh, one's marriage vow is more fundamental 
than, than any political covenant, and yet the political covenant uh, breaks. And this, uh, the, 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 that's the context, and this question that was asked uh, was asked many, many times, that this next question was asked many times, and it's heartbreaking to me, but it, this is a question that was, was asked. Here is my question then. Uh, is there a, a, a time for a family when it may be broken properly in light of God's order, despite the fact that the family as one body is created and operated by, by God? And uh, in what follows is described, and many, of, uh, many questions describe this, a description of a profound breakdown in the family. Uh, because of alcoholism, because of abuse, because of mistreatment, where a father, instead of acting as Christ to his, to his wife, uh, acted uh, brutally uh, with physical abuse or with mental abuse. Uh, oftentimes, this was described uh, in some cases because fathers, uh, and I'm kind of gliding over the details because I don't know what details anyone wants expressed here, but sometimes it was simple greed, fathers who effect effectively abandoned their family for work, for money, sometimes literally abandoned their, their families for, for money to pursue other, other things. Adultery, physical abuse. Uh, and it's described here in this question and many others. At the end of many years of, of abuse, what if a person feels that they must escape from domestic violence, domestic abuse, personal uh, abuse. Uh, even though a person has prayed for this issue a long time, uh, if a person feels comfortable to leave their, their husband, uh, can she be said to be free from sin? This is the, the question here. Uh, although regarding sin and salvation, I know that only God knows, uh, what I want to ask is whether we can say that she may, uh, we can endorse her decision to to leave uh, her husband. And I want to say first, um, I'm quite aware, and you, you all are quite aware, that um, the, uh, the pain that comes from societies where husbands and wives betray each other, and that pain is, is born, as expressed in many questions, most often acutely by children, when, when husbands or wives uh, wrongly terminate marriages, the, the deep pain is felt by, by children who see the, the order of a mother and father who should be focused on raising them up in a godly fashion, instead replaced by mothers and fathers who are at war with each other, separated from each other. And uh, I, uh, reading your questions was heartbreaking. Um, I'll begin by saying that this question, as, as the excellent uh, introduction said, we can, we can find illumination with reference to the family at, by looking to the state and looking to the church and looking to the physical body. The power of the analogy that the Bible makes between the physical body, the, the body of the family, the body of the state, and the body of, of Christ is that when we, we fail in understanding one, we can, we can look to the other uh, to, to understand this. And with, with bodies, of course, uh, we have problems where we need to separate bodies too. Sometimes I have cancer. Sometimes I have an infected hand. And the only way to save my body is to cut off my hand. And uh, this, this is a great analogy that's been used throughout the history of the church to make it, people understand why is it sometimes okay uh, for the state to put someone to death. It's okay for the same reason sometimes you have to chop off an infected finger, an infected hand, an infected uh, arm. Uh, sometimes separation of parts of the body is, is necessary. Uh, we see that it's, it's true only in the case of the physical body in the most dire of circumstances. We, we, don't, we don't treat it lightly. You wouldn't cut off your, your hand because you had a splinter. You wouldn't even cut off your hand if you had a serious burn, even if it was causing you great pain. You would do everything you could to, to revive the, the hand. Uh, and this is a, a good analogy for, for marriages as, as well. Uh, if there's to be separation 
in the, the body of a, a family. It should come only uh, when there is a, a real threat to, to life I itself in the, in the, uh, the construction of, of things. The, the plug on this has come out and the, the, the computer is about to go dead. If you could, if you could plug that in. I think but you look at it. I'll keep talking. You figure it out. Uh, thank you very much. So that's the, the first part is I would recommend to you in your thinking about this that you, you consider the, the very groundwork of the analogy we're talking about for, for help in thinking through these problems. When can we break up the, the body of the, the family? When can we sever the union between man and woman in, in marriage? Uh, we have to think about it in, in terms similar to what we would think of with the, with the body. The, the reason why um, the grounds for breaking up a marriage are so restrictive is because the way a man and a woman are linked in marriage is not the way that I relate to my hand. A, a husband is not the hand, a wife is not the hand. Uh, the, the husband and the wife are not simply members to each other. They are the body. They are connected as the left half of my body is to the right half of my body. If I have a disease in the left half of my body, I can't cut my body in two. There's no way to sustain it. If, if I have a disease, I, I can't cut my heart and divide half of it for my left and half of it for my, my right. Uh, basically, the Christian position has been that the, the only time that you can, you can separate a husband and a wife is when the body is already dead when the, the, the very essential conditions of the life of the married couple has, has ended. So when our, our Lord talked about this, he, he, he spoke profoundly of the need for continuation and, and unity and spoke of a single condition, uh, which has to do with, with porneia is the, the Greek word, but it, it's adultery, it's conditions of a fundamental uh, breakdown of the, the basis of the marital union in a sexual union, and matters that, that are, seem very profound to us, uh, which is people are unhappy in marriage. Um, and I, by unhappiness, I, I don't just mean they don't, they're not getting along well, uh, but we're talking about abuse and different things like this. Uh, that's not explicitly mentioned. Now, some Christians have said, look, physical ab abuse Right, equally strikes at the fundamental nature of the, of the marriage. And there's, there's much to be said for that. Uh, traditionally, what Christians said is there, there are two issues. One is the issue of separation, and another is the issue of, of divorce. So in, in Christian uh, dealings with these matters, what Christians have traditionally said is, distinguish between the situation which a marriage may be ended. And you know a marriage has been ended when someone can remarry. So if a spouse dies, the marriage is ended, and the other spouse can remarry. Okay? That's the end of a marriage. Divorce, in this sense, means we're going to terminate a marriage. We're going to make it as if the bonds between the man and the woman no longer exist. Okay? And uh, what Christians have said for, for millennia is there are very, very, very few conditions where you can do that. One, if any, is adultery. But short of adultery, the, the fundamental basis of the union exists. Now, does this mean that nothing can be done? Absolutely not. Where there was abuse within marriages, uh, Christians said, well, of course you should protect a wife or a husband from other kinds of abuse. But the way to do this is not by ending the marriage, but by allowing the couple to separate. Uh, so this is a, a very, we don't, we, we don't, because divorce is so easy to get now, uh, we don't think very much about separation. But originally, uh, if, and if you read the scriptures where it says, you know, a man and a woman should not be separated from one another. They have a continuing debt to one another. Uh, they have to live together. Men and women should live together under, under one roof. They should live together during the course of their marriage. Um, 
you had a legal duty to live with your, your spouse. And the only, the only way that legal duty could be uh, separated is through a legal act of separation. And that was considered the appropriate remedy in case of uh, physical abuse, uh, drunkenness, these, these sorts of, of things. What difference does it make? Uh, it, it made a lot of difference. For one thing, it meant that somebody who was abusive to their spouse had to support them under the same conditions as before, but under a different roof. Um, but also it, it retained the idea that these people could forgive and come back together if the conditions improved. And um, the biggest consequence legally was if you were separated but not divorced, you couldn't remarry. And this is really what's at, at issue here uh, between divorce and separation. Christians have, have long agreed that separation is an appropriate response to physical abuse. It's an appropriate response to drug, drug abuse, uh, alcohol abuse. But what they didn't agree on is that somebody who had married somebody who was abusive or incapacitated because of alcoholism could then remarry. And this is a, a great question for us because in, in the modern world, of course, uh, we say that we're opposed to polygamy, but what we're really opposed to is, is simultaneous polygamy. We have serial polygamy in the United States where people have three, four, five, six wives, three, four, five, six husbands. Um, what the, what the church said was, look, your marriage vow is so serious that if you marry someone and, and they become abusive and you have to separate from them, you can't remarry. And this is precisely what, what Jesus was, was talking about when he talked about the law. If you uh, remarry someone when you first married and haven't appropriately divorced, then you're a polygamist. You're married to more than one person. And, and that's what's going on in the world uh, today. So uh, two points in, in response. First, uh, there's sickness in the body, and it's extremely painful. There's sickness in the, in the marital body, and it's extremely painful. There's sickness in political bodies, and they're extremely painful. But our modern approach, which says the only thing to do is to split the body in half, that's wrong. There are many other options for treating, treating these disorders. Um, and we, we have jumped to the one that is, that is against recognizing, we talk about recognizing human dignity, recognizing the dignity of the marital uh, covenant. There is a great deal at stake in marriage. A permanent lifelong commitment as, someone, as long as someone keeps marital faithfulness with you, it can't be severed. Um, I would finally just refer you to the analogy of uh, the political body which is the question of whether a man and a woman can separate where there's, there's abuse is very much like the question of whether we can split the state when there's abuse. In many states, there's, there's been abuse. You know, we, have, we have memories in, in many different societies of times when the government has been abusive to the people, when the government has done bad things to the people, when the, when the government has shot and killed people, or, or wrongly imprisoned lots of people. Uh, th this is very, very, very painful. These memories are, are, are very, very, very painful. And generation after generation, they can be used to excite again, upset and, and anger, okay? And, and righteous anger. Um, do they justify splitting the state? If we allowed uh, divorce because of, of minor fault or even serious fault, then we should allow the splitting of the state on a similar basis. The, the political covenant is lesser, not superior to the marital covenant. So think about how uh, your, your understanding of when divorce should be allowed, what that means for when the state should be dissolved. Um, I think we all agree that at some point, the abusiveness of the state becomes such that the people uh, rightfully seek a different government. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, but think of what that would mean if every time one part of your country or my country disagreed with another part, if we said, that's enough for us to sever it. Even when there's real abuse, even when there's real difficulty, if your, your belief is that marriages can be 
can be torn apart on that basis, then it should be the same with countries and nations. And, and yet we understand, I believe, that as political people, we have to suffer a lot from each other. Not that we don't take account of that, not that we don't take protective measures against that, but we don't divide the nation on that basis. So I, I would, my, my key answer to you is one, I, I, I love that you hear the word of God and long for a true family, even though your own families have been, have been broken. Uh, there's so much of this pain and it's real and it's awful. And uh, Christ suffered on the cross because of this. this these wounds are, are part of the wounds that Christ bore for us on the, the cross. But when you think through your reaction to this pain, uh, think through it in terms of the, the bodily analogies that we've been talking about before and the clear guidance of Jesus Christ that uh, unless the, the grounds of the covenant in, in uh, sexual faithfulness have been broken, there is no ground for, for divorce. Though there may be a ground for separation uh, without the possibility of, of remarriage. Uh, these are great matters and I, I applaud you uh, thinking, thinking through them. Uh, next question. Uh, people in the world, particularly non-believers, sometimes require Christians to explain uh, what cannot be easily explained, such as God is alive, or God came, to the, came in the flesh and was killed on the cross because of my sins, or love is of greater power and strength than the world, uh, or it is better to rule the people by the principle of love rather than the fear of punishment. Loving God is more than, uh, worth more than anything in the world, even the power of money, the power of military power, and highly advanced technologies. But if I'm the only believer in my family, or if I'm the only believer in my society, how can I explain this to others and, and persuade them? Uh, this is, many of you asked a question similar to this, which is the, the problem of particularity, I might say, here we've been studying the, the Bible all, all semester, all year, uh, maybe through your three years in, in law school, we've learned much from Jesus Christ and the example uh, and teaching of the scriptures. But all of this has come through our reading of the Bible and our life here in, in community. Uh, how can this be shared with the world? Particularly if we think about what the foundation is here, that God exists, that God loves us, that God has shown us his love in Jesus Christ, that he set the example for us to follow by dying on, on the cross. Uh, how, can I, how can I teach the, the world these things uh, when the world doesn't believe these things? And I would say uh, to you, this is a, a great and, and profound question and part of the feeling of loneliness of the Christian in the world sometimes. The re reason we're described as pilgrims through the world is the more you know about the love of Jesus Christ and the truth, and the more you, you, you experience the, the solidity of that truth in your life, the world seems filled with more and more like strangers, people who live according to entirely different ways and customs. As much if you, if you were, grew up in Korea and then you go to the United States, you would think, wow, the, I am a stranger in a strange land, to use the to use the, the King James Version of the, of the Bible. I'm a stranger in a strange land. I, this is a weird land and I don't belong here. Yes, you, 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 are, you are a son of God, a, a daughter of God. You, you are anticipating the rebirth of heaven and earth. You are, are living in the resurrection and its power without, without fear of death, without fear of disease not because your body has been transformed yet, but because of your confidence in the coming resurrection. The concerns of, of the world, which is to, to improve life for this short period that we have breath is not your concern. You're living for eternity. And so your, your life moves on very different, different wheels, uh, on very different grounds than the, the world does. Um, the scriptures show us again and again how you convince the world of, of God's power, uh, which is not by philosophical argument. Nothing wrong with philosophical argument. If somebody wants to argue philosophy, I like to argue philosophy. 
I will argue philosophy with you. Uh, but this is not uh, how the, the prophets, this is not how Moses, uh, this is not how Jesus Christ, this is not how Paul uh, brought people to the correct understanding of, of the world. Uh, they did it through life. This life involves speech, it in, involves talking, but it, it involves showing people, most of all, what a life lived to the Father with a full sense of his love means. It, it involved uh, dying, it involved living, it involved suffering, it involved explanation and speech. Uh, it involves everything that we do that makes our calling on the name of, of the Lord in public appropriate. Uh, it requires courage in the, in the sense that you're right. Sometimes when you call on the name of, of the Lord, people won't understand what you're talking about. But it doesn't involve courage in the sense that there is nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus Christ in this world. And if you live to Jesus Christ and you speak of Jesus Christ, you are the most uh, persuasive and powerful person that, that you can be. Uh, don't fear being incomprehensible to people. If, if I feared that, I would never open my mouth. I'm incomprehensible to most people most of the time. Rightly so. I talk funny. So don't fear that. Fear betraying Jesus in your life, betraying Jesus with your mouth, because Jesus is the logos. That is to say, he is the word of the world. There is nothing more intelligible than Jesus Christ. Nothing. The most intelligible thing that you can do in the world is to live like Jesus, speak like Jesus, speak of Jesus, speak for Jesus, Jesus. Professor Peck gave a, a wonderful devotion on, on Tuesday where he pointed out that the, the meaning of the Bible is Jesus Christ. He, he's found in the Old Testament. He's obviously found in the New Testament. He is what holds the Testaments together. He is the one we know when we know the Scriptures. Uh, the, Jesus makes the Bible intelligible. And one thing I've been trying to, to argue to you in this class is the world reveals its incoherence all the time. The strategy of the world doesn't work. It, it makes no sense. Hurry up and, and make more money and hurry up and gain more power. And Solomon just says, we're all going to die. Right? What do you, what do you, if you win the prize, if you grab the, the brass ring, if you achieve all that you hope to do, you end up in a wormy grave. It, it doesn't make any sense. And as the world has increased in, in power and sophistication, it's also increased in, in tottering on the edge of self-annihilation. Uh, we, we are not achieving according, if you measure the things by the worldly ends, we aren't achieving. We haven't conquered death. The, the people who are the greatest in the world are not uh, more human, more self-controlled, more virtuous. I, I don't say this to, to re reproach anyone or to say I'm better th than them. I, I just say, uh, look at the trajectory of where society is going and see if by its own announcement of principles, it's succeeding. I say the answer is no. I, I say that the, the principles of the world don't make it intelligible. I say that the most intelligible thing in the world is Jesus Christ. And if you believe that, don't be afraid to speak of the world as Jesus Christ has, has revealed it to you. Will you always win the argument? There is no argument, okay? There is no argument. There are blind people in the world and there are people who can see. A, a person who can see cannot necessarily argue a blind person into an understanding of the colors of the rainbow. It can't be done. But the rainbow is beautiful. And if the person opens their eyes, they'll agree. Several of you asked this question, which is, which is a, a question uh, about ethics. But because several of you asked it, I thought I'd, I'd address it. Uh, you, 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 this question says, Malachi 2.14, why? 
the Lord, is, why is the Lord not respecting your sacrifices? The Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth because you have broken faith with her, with her though she is your partner. Has the Lord not made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. Uh, referring to this, Dean Enlow mentioned that the marriage is a unity in God and seeks godly offspring. Um, my question is, would, would, that be, uh, would it not be a true unity in God when a Christian marries a non-Christian? Uh, this is I important to me because recently I, I heard from someone that they are considering marrying someone who is not a Christian. Um, what should I say? Uh, you know, we have not done a full doctrine of marriage in the family because this is a, a law school where we were considering constitutional law and, and only in the broadest sense were we considering these things. You should all, uh, when you think about marrying, talk to your pastors. And all of you should be seeking from your, your churches teaching on the Christian understanding of, of family. But uh, it is the overwhelming interpretation of Christians throughout time that Christians should marry Christians. Um, a marriage between a Christian and a non-Christian is certainly valid. That is to say, Christians and non-Christians may marry. It's, it's physically possible to do. You can marry somebody taller than you, somebody shorter than you, somebody uh, cuter than you, somebody less cute than you, somebody richer than you, somebody poorer than you. You can do it, okay? Uh, you know, I recommend you all, all to, to uh, marry the one who, who God chooses for you, okay? Um, but overwhelmingly, Christians have said there is a, an ethical duty not to marry non-Christians. And the, the basis of, of this is well put in the, the quotation that was made. Uh, the goal of marriage is uh, threefold, okay? One is the, the unity between man and woman. Um, the other is, uh, God says, you guys have out of control sexual lusts, and the only way for you to control these is within marriage. Marriage is a, a help for the needs of the flesh and, and against lust. But the key goal of, of marriage at the level of the unity between husband and wife is godly offspring. And this means that you need to be in a position where you can raise your children up in the faith. You need to be able to, to raise your children. And if husband and wife can't agree on how to do this because they have fundamentally different orientations to, to God and what should be taught is fundamental, then there will be warfare in the family. Uh, if, if a man and a woman are not uh, drawn together towards God, but uh, they're, they're each seeking in different directions, then this natural unity between man and woman is only of the flesh. But a marriage where a husband and a wife are also drawn together in the spirit towards God, uh, this is a great and, and necessary uh, aid to marriage. Uh, sometimes after the flesh, you know, man and a woman don't like each other very much. But if they're still both pursuing God, they'll grow back together. But if you take that aid away, you've taken away a very great aid from, from marriage. The Bible is full of this example where a, a godly person marries a person who is idolatrous and is corrupted by this. And if, if you think that you can marry someone who's not a believer and re remain strong in your, your faith, you may be being arrogant and prideful. Uh, Paul does say that if you become a Christian, once you, you've already been married and you become a Christian, you don't have to leave your marriage. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. A Christian can be married to a non-Christian. It's possible to be. And he even says that in that you shouldn't be fearful because God is doing something powerful in, in the marriage. And if your spouse will stay with you, you should stay with them. But with, with respect to the question of whether you should deliberately enter into that kind of difficulty in, in marriage, uh, the, the biblical answer is no, don't, don't do that. 
you, you shouldn't be yoked together with, with unbelievers, and there's, there's no greater yoking uh, that, that can be imagined than in, in marriage. So several of you asked that question. It's, it's a good question. It's a little outside of, of our field, but because it's on several of your minds, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to answer it. Uh, another question that was asked several times. Uh, during the last lecture, uh, Dean Enloe posited several times that anything that prevents a person from being fruitful and multiplying is impinging upon said individual's freedom. However, nothing I have read in the Bible suggests that a, a man or a woman is required to dedicate their life solely to this task. Yet I have heard Hill's professors and other Christian men question whether or not a woman can be a good wife and mother if she also has a career. However, in today's society, most women have a dream job or goals and ambitions that they wish to accomplish during the course of their lifetime. I've only ever heard one woman state that her dream is to be a housewife. Also, according to the Bible, a husband has a duty to love and give himself up uh, for his wife, as Christ did for the church. Thus, I wonder when most women desire a career, what is a Christian hu husband sacrificing or giving up for his wife when he requires her instead to be a housewife? Is limiting your wife to a traditional role rather than supporting her goals uh, really an act of love or, or sacrifice? A great question. Um, so we live in a time when, th when there's a very strong ideology called uh, feminism, which sees, uh, tries to say that in history, uh, there's been a great oppression of, of women uh, by men and that uh, societies, they, they call them patriarchal, uh, were, were run and managed for the benefit of women and at the, uh, uh, excuse me, the benefit of men at the expense of women, and that there needs to be a, a kind of liberation movement of, of women and a push for political equality. And uh, let, us, let us all ag agree that the history of humanity is a great history of injustices and, and oppression um, of men and women, okay? Uh, I, I, think it's, I think it is, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a, the most gentle word I, I can say. I think it's wrong to look at uh, history and think that there were societies that especially focused on oppressing women. Um, men and women throughout most of history have all lived very desperate lives, very close to starvation, extinction, uh, filled with, with all manner of oppressions. And in this, the, the, the peasant man and the peasant woman, the poor man and the poor woman suffered uh, greatly and, uh, and equally. Um, the, my concern about the, the modern doctrine of feminism mostly is not that we shouldn't think what special ways do women suffer and how do we address that? That seems to me a wholly good question. Now let's think about how women specially suffer, what injustices they suffer, and how to address those. Uh, the fear I have about feminism is it glorifies something that no man should want and no woman should want, which is none of you should want a career more than a godly full life. And if you're called to singleness, if you're called to devote yourself to Jesus Christ, that's a wonderful life. Because Paul says you don't have to worry, if you're a man, you don't have to worry about your, your wife or your children. If you're a woman, you don't have to worry about your wife or your children. If you're called to, to singleness, God bless you. That's a, a great gift, Paul says. It's a great gift. But it's not most people's gift. It's really not. And for that reason, Paul says most of you are called to marriage. And if you're called to marriage, what you're called to do is to join with another person in lifelong unity as a way of symbolizing and worshiping God to the world in your very, very flesh and to bring forth uh, godly offspring, to spend your days talking of God's ways with your children, living out God's ways with your, your spouse, being a, an aid and a buttress to the church, uh, preparing yourself for, for the life to come, all right? I don't want a career. What the heck is a career? You, you mean a, 
I mean, I want to make money. I want to support my family. I want to do all these things. But I would much rather live at home with my family than I would taking a, a, a long commute to an office every day and being away from them. Men didn't want to go to work in businesses. Men didn't want to leave their, their families. Part of the destructiveness of the whole modern economic order is that for most of human history, the place where you earned your living was with your family. The very word economics comes from the study of how a household can become productive to sustain itself. Oikos is the word for home. Oikonomos is what are the rules by which families become productive? Uh, I'm afraid uh, you, you know, feminism is little more than a part of the way that the, the modern capitalist socialist world has glorified uh, leaving your, 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 what's most important in life to go do something which earns you money. And the fact that we live in economies today where people feel like both husbands and wives have to work and they don't have time to raise their own children and they can't be productive. I want to work with my wife. My grandfather worked with his wife in a field, in a farm. He, did, he, he would go off to work every morning with his wife. They would go out and they would milk cows and they would feed chickens and they would weed and they would farm together. All right? Uh, that's the way most of humanity has lived throughout most of its history. In the last century, we've tried an experiment where, where, where portions of the people leave the household to go work with strangers. It's terrible. It's alienating. It's miserable. No one likes it. It's unhealthy. It's causing degeneration to society. I don't know what to do about it. You don't know what to do about it. But let me tell you this. Thinking that women are oppressed if they don't get to go and join the rat race, well, I don't know what to say about that. You're not supposed to want to go and work with strangers far from home. If you, if you want that, if you've made that your desire, uh, I don't know what to say. If you feel it's necessary to do it, you have to do it. You should do it well. You, you should work for who you have to work to. But look, this kind of wage labor that we do in the ancient world was considered the lowest kind. This is what poor, the poorest people had to do was leave their own household and go work for others away from their home. So uh, if women are working in the workplace, we need to think about how they should be justly treated. We need to worry about the things that are appropriate to men and women working together in one place. There are all sorts of interesting questions about equality and how you manage that. The only error I find in the, in the question is this idea that if a man, if their dream is a job, if any man here, if your dream is a job, that is to say, working for a wage for someone else, let me tell you some other dreams you can have. There's a lot higher that you can aim. Your, you, your dream should be to be a, a father. Your dream should be to be a, a holy man. Your dream should be to serve the church. Your, your dream should be to uh, give your life as Jesus Christ did for the, the betterment of the world, to, to bring balance and love and order and peace to the world. If your dream is to get a really high paying job, your dream is, is not good enough. And I, I'm not trying to criticize the, this question by saying women are greedy or anything like that. Obviously not. My point is all of us need to be dreaming better dreams. And the, the current trajectory that society is on where more and more and more people are all working in the workplace and fewer and fewer people are raising children, that isn't a good dream either. So I don't have a solution uh, for you on, on all of those kinds of questions, except this. Dream a better dream. Dream the dream that, that God has for us, which is that we all live together in the, in the household of, of God. Uh, last uh, big group of questions that uh, I want to address in conclusion is many of you have said, I see something in God's law that looks wonderful. I, I see a depth in God's law that's very powerful. I see uh, how God's love uh, shows the limitations of, of, modern, law, of modern law. Uh, but I don't know how to apply that in society. 
I don't, I don't know how, how we bring that about today. There seems like there's some different change conditions. Um, how do we bring this, we bring this uh, about? And uh, uh, two points. Uh, one is, um, you aren't the savior of the world. Jesus is. Uh, Jesus will come again and he will set things, set things aright. You are, however, a follower of Jesus Christ, and you are supposed to be longing for his kingdom. You are supposed to be praying, Lord, your kingdom come. You're, this is supposed to be the measure of your desire, is the, the kingdom of, of God. And part of the reason we, we read the scriptures and read about the perfect order of God is not because we have a plan to go to the legislative house and, you know, Bill 316, the, the restoration of the kingdom of God on earth, and we pass it through the legislature. That's not our goal. The, the first goal that you need to have to make you really aware of the laws that are around you is what is glorious about the kingdom of God that we don't have here on earth? Your basic job as a, as a Christian in terms of your affections and your attitudes is to make sure that you don't love this world as it is right now more than the kingdom of God which is ruling in your heart. As I said before, you should feel like a stranger in a strange land. You should be filled with, with longings which are greater than the longings of the world around you, which, which leads you to do bold and unusual things in the world, which make you look peculiar in the world. Um, I delight that so many of you have read the Word of God with me this semester, and so many of you think, uh, I could never figure out how to, how to realize this, this beautiful law of love under the present conditions. You can't. I can't. Uh, for two reasons. One, because for the law of love to work, we have to be loving, and we're not. If you want to work towards doing that, become more loving. Uh, secondly, just a reminder about law school. Law school is not government school. Your calling and my calling as, as lawyers is not the calling of legislators. Uh, the, 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 what you should expect from studying the law is not that you know how to write a better law. This is not politics school. It's not, it's not government school. Lots of lawyers become politicians because they're familiar with the current state of laws. That's, that's true, and it's not inappropriate. But... Um, the, the goal of a governor is to govern. This is Calvin says this, John Calvin. He says, a governor should govern so that he becomes an icon. He becomes a symbol of God's government of the world. People should look at a good ruler and they should look through him and say, you know what? A good, loving God governs the world. That's what good government looks like. Whereas a good advocate... He has the role of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we come to people who need advice, we need, who need counsel. We come to people who need representation. Uh, Jesus says, look, everybody who calls out for water and food and clothing, everyone who calls out from a prison for companionship, everyone who, who needs a counselor, they should come to me. And they speak in my name when they call out. And if you don't hear their calls, then you're missing the voice of Jesus Christ. Our, our goal, our development as, as lawyers is not to be universal fonts of practical political strategies. That's what's wrong with law in the United States is every lawyer and every judge wants to be a little legislator. Our, our primary task is to understand the laws not to make them. And that's a great task. I think it's a greater task, actually, because many legislators have no idea what they're doing. Our job is to, to understand how the laws, whatever their condition, good and bad, provide the means for us to serve as Jesus Christ served. And if our study of the laws today has awakened you to the, the depth of their meaning and significance, then you are better prepared to be a lawyer even if you don't know how to change the world. But I do.
Go forth and make disciples of all nations. Tell them of the Father and the, and the Son and the, and the Holy Ghost. Watch the church baptize new, new Christians. Watch the kingdom of, of God grow. Show it in all of, that you do for other people that you hear the voice of Christ calling out from the lips of the, of the needy and those who come to you for help and fulfill their needs. And you will do more to forward your, your goals uh, than any forceful legislative agenda could do. Thank you again very much for your, your questions and thank you very much for your attention this, this semester. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness in, in all of your, of your questions. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this community where we can study law as we, as we worship you. Study law so that we learn how much we have to praise you for and thank you for in the laws. Our Father in heaven, please bless this community that it may always be focused on the great love that we have in Jesus Christ and the wisdom that comes from abiding in that love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.